All right, folks, one of the major speakers today here at Afrotech was Stacey Abrams, of course, who ran twice for governor of Georgia. She's been involved in a number of voting rights groups as well. She and I sat down for a conversation. Check it out. Stacey, somebody's probably asking, what the hell are you doing here in Afrotech? <laughs> well, I am with my people. I recently wrote a novel called Coded Justice that focuses on the intersection of AI, DEI, and veterans' health care. And I really wanted to explore the conversation about what does DEI mean for our communities, but what does it mean as part of the larger evolution of our society, and what does it mean for democracy? And Afrotech is the place to be. Um, where did the idea come from? So it really started for me when we, I was watching the attacks on DEI, and at the same time, we were hearing about how D AI was evolving and how much it would mean to the future of society. And I wanted to think of a way to connect the dots for people who see them as separate conversations. But we know that if DEI is not embedded in how we think about how we build the world, then too many of us are gonna get left out and left behind. And AI as a technology has the ability to really revolutionize who we are and how we are served, but not if it can't see us, and worse, not if it is weaponized against us. And there's no community that more reflects the importance of both DEI, but also of a government and a society that takes care of its own than thinking about our veterans and what happens with their health care. Uh, during the session we live streamed, you, you talked about there was an initiative um, that, uh, that dealt with, that utilized AEI and DEI, uh, and, and that, that frames it differently. Explain that. So I was referencing on Labor Day, this administration announced that they are doing a pilot in nine states where they are going to let AI help make decisions about our health care for Medicare patients, meaning the elderly and the disabled. The issue is that a few weeks later, the same administration said that it is unlawful to use AI to, to use DEI to train AI models meaning you have the responsibility to serve a population you can't understand. Because what we know is the folks who are creating this are largely white. And so therefore it's being defined through a white prism. Well, it, most of our research, I mean, we know that in healthcare in particular. Wait a minute, how the cameras on these devices are set Absolutely. And it's not built for our skin tone. It isn't. And so we know, so Joy Bulamwini is this amazing uh, doctor who wrote a book called Unmasking AI. And she really explored the issue of what they refer to as algorithmic justice. That might sound esoteric until you realize your grandmother may not get health care because the Medicare decision about whether she gets a certain treatment is being determined by someone who doesn't understand that black women have a higher likelihood of some type of medical issue, that Latina men, that Latino men face certain issues. If we can't understand the population you're serving, how is that service going to be valuable, especially when it comes to healthcare? And so the work that I've been doing, especially using coded justice as a point of entry, is about how do we make sure we understand this isn't just sci-fi, this is our everyday. Right. Well, it's sort of like when the NFL um, had racism embedded in how it provided coverage to former athletes who had injuries. Yeah. They, they, they was literally, oh, well, um, the black athletes, they're not, they're not as smart. I mean, that was, it was literally in the medical decision exactly. as to grant who gets coverage. The, Amer the American Psychological Association recently, I think, apologized for its, in, its refusal for many years to understand that its pronouncements about mental health had a racial bias. And we've got to remember, DEI is not just race. It is race, it is ethnicity, but it's also ability. It is whether or not you have mental illnesses. It's about whether you have physical disabilities. And if we aren't allowed to understand the majority of our population, if we can't navigate and research and learn, if information is denied, then the services provided are wrong. And, and one of the things you kept emphasizing, we have to take it upon ourselves uh, to educate our own community about really how broad this is now being used. We did a story of a young man, they were utilizing AI, uh, and uh, they, the, 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 uh, the software thought that his bag of Doritos yes. was a weapon. Yeah. I mean, we're now talking about my goodness, cops could have been dispatched, guns drawn, and now we've got uh, another situation of a young brother shot and killed because he has some Doritos. Exactly, part of what we have to understand about the intersection of AI and DEI, 
AI is a technology. It is a tool. But the people who use the tools are what we have to be concerned about. You can use it for good or for you can use it for evil. Exactly. Tools can be used to build or destroy. And the information those tools possess determine the quality of the services they can provide. And when you live in a nation that right now is erasing information, is cutting research, is outlawing knowledge. I mean, just here in Texas, they just forced the ouster of the head of the Alamo, the National Associ the Association the, the, that was doing the, the Alamo. The Alamo Trust. The Alamo Trust. They forced her out because she said, we've got to consider the indigenous people, the enslaved who were part of what led to the Alamo. When she was forced out, not because she said anything wrong, but because she told the truth. Right. She was forced out because Texas Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick yes. uh, is uh, a, 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 a MAGA idiot. Uh, he wants to deny the issue of race. Uh, listen, Dan Patrick used to be a, used to be a sportscaster at a at yeah. KHOU TV here. Grew up watching him. I used to debate used to debate him on the debate show here, and he's even crazier today than he was 20 years ago. He's down the lieutenant governor, and how our system works in this state, lieutenant governor is actually more powerful than the governor, and so that's what we're now dealing with. Yeah, and and the reason I want us to think about these examples is that. When you hear AI, it sometimes feels so remote or so much smarter than us. Sounds like Will Smith's iRobot. Exactly. And the thing of it is, it is every day, but it's also part of a system. I've been talking about the 10 steps to autocracy and authoritarianism. There are 10 things that autocrats do, that authoritarians do, to seize power from a democracy. And among those powers, among those steps, is they, they gut government so it doesn't work. They fire people who aren't loyalist. They expand powers they don't possess. They use powers they possess to do things that are wrong. And if AI is one of the technologies they can use to leverage this power, we lose democracy even faster. But one of the core pillars is that they go after communities that they consider vulnerable. Mm -hmm. DEI is the central pillar of a pluralistic democracy. It is no mistake that when this administration took power and the, for the two years preceding it, DEI was under attack. They attacked it because DEI is the centerpiece that holds up all of our democracy, because if you can remove access to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, right. if you can get rid of the Americans with Disabilities Act, right. if you can gut Title I education, if you can deny SNAP benefits and Medicaid to the vulnerable, what you can do is collapse people's belief in democracy and replace it with authoritarianism that means that we never have freedom again, but we've got to fight back. And part of the way we can fight back includes the tools of AI. Well, the points you just made there, many times in speeches that I give, uh, I talk about how all of these groups should be thanking black people. That if you're disabled and you're talking about the Miracle Disabilities Act, you should thank black people. That's the 64 Civil Rights Act. Uh, if you're a woman and you're an engineer, a doctor, uh, uh, and you went to one of these grad schools, Title IX, Title IX. that's a provision of the Civil Rights Act. That's DEI. And, and, and what, uh, and unfortunately, when we talk about civil rights in this country, uh, is so many people who want to define it as black, and the reality is we know what we fought for, but also, if you gay and you happy about same-sex marriage, you better thank black folks for that 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. Okay. And so, what we're up against is, and, and what I framed it, specifically for us, I said, this is a massive effort to completely defund black America. They are attacking business, academic, nonprofits, social groups, the entire black infrastructure. That's what they want to take out or massively weaken. So I, I think you're absolutely right. And the reason I use DEI as well as civil rights, civil rights is the way we describe it, but you also have to use the language and you have to understand those who are attacking you. The reason they say DEI is that they were able to demonize the language to make us run away from it, but they know what they're talking about. Oh, Christopher, so, Christopher Russo with Rufo was absolutely. very clear. They said first with CRT, we want to put anything exactly. dealing with diversity under that ban. Exactly, and and the reality is then it was woke the next year. Then it was exactly, DEI. Exactly, but DEI has always been expansive. DEI has always contained all of the laws and the rules and the regulations that have made this country accessible. And you're right, almost every one of those rules had to be created in order to cure America's original sin towards black people. But the re reality for everyone else is to know that they start with us. They never stop with us. Right. They practice their harm on us. See, they I practice think mistake, their expand on here's, 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 here's the mistake I think what happened with DEI when the attack started. And, and I was trying to combat as much as I could. The problem was there are many, even many of us, we were framing it within, well, 75% of the DEI jobs are white folks. And I'm like, okay, those are DEI jobs. 
I'm like, first of all, guys, chief diversity officer was before that one. Before that, it was the community affair. I said, look, there's a long line coming from, from uh, the 1960s. I said, the problem that y'all understand is all of the programming, exactly. all of the investment falls under that banner. Yeah. That's separate than that individual with a job title. Exactly. We, if you go to aprnetwork.org, we have an entire timeline of what is DEI. So if you read... Uh, pro- aprnetwork.org. APRnetwork. Aprnetwork. So it okay. stands for American Pride Rises because you're not going to take my pride from me and you're not going to tell me that I'm not American simply because I don't look like what you expect. So American Pride Rises Network. So aprnetwork.org. We've got two things there. One, we have a timeline that lays out, just as you did, the history of how DEI came to be. And we know that this is the history they're using because if you read Project 2025, everything they attack is everything DEI built. Right. But the second part is that we have, and this is one of the reasons I'm excited about Afrotech, we have a chat bot called Adiva, E-D-I-V-A, and you can ask them any questions about DEI because the reality is as much as they may be railing against it, it's not illegal. You can't right. change the law with an executive order. You can't repeal a constitutional amendment with a tantrum. Which is why it's shameful with all these corporations exactly. going, well, since he signed it, we can't do this. It's not it. He doesn't, that's the, that applies to the federal government. Exactly. Not state, not county, not city, not school board, exactly. not corporation. And, and even his federal edicts don't work because he's covered by federal law. You can't repeal the 14th Amendment right. by saying, I don't like it. And so what we've got to recognize, and that's why we created APRnetwork.org, for people to understand what's under attack. You pointed it out. When Chris Rufo started with CRT and we apologized, when he went after woke and we tried to defend, or didn't defend it, we tried to pretend we didn't use it. We have to stop letting them demonize our language because when they can change your language, they can change your mind. And so that's our first job. And our second job is that if there are 10 steps to destroying democracy, there are 10 steps to freedom and power. And so the other website I'm going to give people is 10stepscampaign.org. That's the place where we are helping people understand what is our power and what can we do. And I want to thank you because you've been railing about this, but also educating folks about the fact that they may be on on the attack, but we don't have to be on the defense. We can be on the offense and we can start pushing back and defending our democracy right now. Um, We are here in Houston. I'm born and raised here. Um, This state has the most eligible black voters of any state in the country. Next door is Louisiana. A third of that state's African-American. Yet we look at turnout numbers. Uh, they're not what they should be. I have been, talking about railing, I've been saying our goal has to be a minimum 70% threshold. Because if we're voting at 70%, we're talking about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of votes could make the difference. Uh, turnout numbers for black folks were not what they should have been in Georgia in 2024, in North Carolina in 2024. So what I keep arguing to our people We actually can win if we're maximizing that power at the ballot box. But people have to believe there's something that it's worth it. And you and I both know it's not voter apathy. It's voter despair. Yep. When you've seen generational poverty, you're from Texas. I grew up in Mississippi, came of age in Georgia. When things don't change, you've stopped believing that you can be a part of change. But we're in the moment of a crisis where now is the time where we remind people not just that our power has worked before, but that they're afraid of our power in a way they never have been. In 17 years, this nation is majority minority. That means if we start working now, not trying to change the mind of the 77 million or trying to remind the 75 million why they voted the right way, but the 90 million who didn't think their voices mattered, but you do that by proving that democracy can work. So in the midst of destroying democracy, when they gut snap, when they steal from our children to pay for wealthy people to get their tax cuts, now is the time for us to step in and use this moment to explain to people you may not be into politics, but politics is into you, and it is a stalker. And here right. are all of the things about you. <laughs> here are all the things that you need that I'm not asking you to vote for this person you don't know or to believe that this person is going to be different. I'm asking you to vote for you. I'm asking you to say that I deserve better, and I'm going to take this time out of my life to try to make things better for me and for mine. That's why democracy is so important. Um, we're dealing with the reality of groups also under attack. Uh, recently, New Georgia Project shut down group you were uh, 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 very much involved with, uh, and what I have been, and, and look, funding is being uh, impacted as well. Black Voters Matter, uh, 40%, funding down 40% as well. A lot of people are, are running away from, from this fight. Um, what I keep yelling as well is that, uh, one, we can't be locked into election cycles. It has to be 365, seven days a week. But we also have to keep 
these voter groups intact when the election is over because whether you win or lose, you still need those folks coming to the city council meeting, exactly. the school board meeting, the county commission, the state board meeting. And that's the thing that drives me crazy there yeah. is that we act like, oh, that's the end of the process. I can go back to what I was doing. I'm like, no, 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 no. We need you. you got to stay in this thing. Exactly. So one of the steps in the 10 steps to freedom and power. So step one is commit. Step two is share. We got to share the knowledge that you have. We got to tell people what we're learning. They've broken our ecosystem of media and knowledge. We've got to tell people what we know. Yep. Number three, we've got to organize. Number four, we've got to mobilize. It's not enough to say I'm, I'm right. mad, but you talk about the divine nine all the time. How are we using our organizations to mobilize to solve problems right now? Because asking someone to vote in two years doesn't matter if, they can't, if they're hungry today. Yep. And then the next step, we've got to litigate. We've got to keep fighting. It is okay if we lose lawsuits as long as we are fighting them. Because you and I both know Thurgood Marshall lost a lot before yep. he won. Then we have to disrupt. We've got to do these protests, but protests aren't enough. We've got to know our rights. We've got to be out there. We've got to be filming everything. Then we've got to do the work of denying them the ability to change our language. That's why I use DEI everywhere I go. But then, to your point, we've got to engage. If somebody has asked for their, your vote, they need to hear your voice. Yeah. The day after they get elected, that's when they should be really, really afraid. Because you should be showing up everywhere. And it's not enough to go to your congressperson. Go to your city council member, because one day they want another job, too. Right. And they have just as much of a stake in you getting your access to your services as anybody else does. So your school board members, your city council, your county commission, we can't let anyone off the hook. When they are trying to take our rights, yep. everyone is responsible. And then if they won't do the job, then you elect someone new. That's step nine. Because ultimately, and I think this is where you and I spend so much of our time, we've got to demand the nation we deserve. It's not about fixing and going back to right. getting what we had. Clearly what we had wasn't strong enough. We now have to demand what we deserve for the next round. And with this Calais decision coming out on voting rights in the next six months, it is more important than ever that we start understanding it's not just power in D.C., it's power in Houston, in Atlanta, in Montezuma, Georgia, in Gulfport, Mississippi. It is power at the local level that will determine our future. Uh, last question. Um, so let's do this here. Uh, that's your camera right there. There's somebody who is watching this. Yes. Uh, and they're saying... Stacy, I hear all that. I stood out there in Georgia, and you didn't win, and uh, Kamala didn't win, uh, this person for school district didn't win, and I'm tired, I wanna go line dancing, uh, I wanna do boots on the ground, I wanna sit, I wanna rest. What do you say to that person, brother or sister, senior citizen, middle age, or somebody who's 18 to 35, what do you tell that person? That we aren't guaranteed success, but as long as we have democracy, we are guaranteed access. And every time we let them tell us we're not enough, then we are giving them permission to take from us. The 10stepscampaign.org is about how we reclaim our freedom and our power. And the reason we have to do that, I didn't win an election, but not getting the title does not exempt me from the work. Not getting what we want does not change what we need. And in a democracy, the only way you get what you need is by showing up over and over again, outlasting those who think that if they hurt you enough, you'll just go away. I I'm never going anywhere. You can't get rid of me that easily. And they should not be able to tell any of us our voices don't matter, our power isn't real. Because if it wasn't real, they wouldn't be fighting so hard to take it from us. Absolutely. Uh, you gave a whole bunch of websites. Two, just two, just two. <laughs> the two to Org to learn about DEI and what's under attack, and then 10stepscampaign.org to learn how to fight back. The only two things you need to know. All right, Stacey, appreciate it. Good to Roland, see you. Roland, thanks for having me. I thanks appreciate a lot. it.